actually with a colleague of mine, Vitian Zavrtanik, uh, we will have a brief, let's say, schnell course um, on, on deep learning. And we, we have quite, quite a lot of topics actually to present. Uh, we would like to bring this uh, very fashionable, I would say, uh, topic um, to your attention and maybe to give you some ideas. How could you use in your work um, the, the te techniques we'll be talking about? So um, before I, um, uh, I start, I shall introduce myself and colleague of mine, Vita and Zavrtenik. We are both coming from uh, the same university, but from the Faculty of Computer Information Science. We are coming from the Visual Cognitive Systems Lab, uh, which is dealing with intelligent systems um, that are visually enabled uh, in, uh, intelligent systems, as, as, uh, as we usually say. So basically, we would like to develop con mainly competencies uh, related to computer vision that lately is almost entirely uh, based on deep learning techniques and to bring these competencies in different different robots uh, or, or, or different platforms from mobile phones to, to mobile robots. And we would like to basically uh, add these vision competencies also to robots as well in form of cognitive robotics. These are a couple of platforms that we are using just to give you some background um, what our main research interests are. Uh, and basically, they are pretty much aligned. And also the work that we do in um, recent years is, depends heavily on deep learning. So we would like to pass a little bit of this uh, knowledge that we have also to you as in this, you're, you're not computer scientists in the sense that you're working in, in the field of AI and so, so um, we would we'll like to introduce to these concepts from our point of view. Our goal is that we try to answer to the following questions. So like a general questions, like what deep learning is, what machine learning is, what artificial intelligence is, uh, what it is used for, right? So we'll be talking mainly about computer vision and natural language processing that also can be used in, in, in your area of expertise. How does deep learning work? What problems can be solved? How do we develop such kind of deep learning solutions? Uh, what are the advantages and limitations of this technology? What are the benefits? Uh, and I will make an overview of the field so, uh, where I will present the main principle, principles like really very brief theoretical background. I'll show a couple of equations, but Okay, I usually start my talks with this slide about this media hype, which is around this AI, artificial intelligence, which is uh, in the recent years, it's quite visible, I, I would say. There is a lot of papers, what can be done, what can be done, uh, how will AI will prevail in the world, uh, even, you know, bring us back from the dead or, or something like that. So I always look at such reports from a distance and I'm quite skeptical about that because I know what is behind that. And this is what I would like to give you in, in, in these three days, basically. Some really um, opinion from, from someone who is working in this area, uh, because as I understand, you're not from, from this area, right? So um, probably you, you're, you don't have a lot of experience with AI tools and methodologies and so on. And I would like to, to give you like a touch, a touch of that. First, I would say most of those uh, news that I showed before that are about AI are actually about machine learning and more specifically about deep learning. So what really happened in the last five to 10 years, this really boom in this era is mainly driven by deep learning, by those techniques that I will be uh, talking about in, in, in this workshop. But let us look what all, all these different terms mean. So artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, one overarching uh, discipline, which is composed of different sub uh, subfields, like like reasoning, like like planning, and machine learning is quite quite important um, research area within the AI uh, itself. And of course, they overlap. You can use machine learning to to solve planning problems, to help reasoning, and so on. So this is really a very schematic demonstration of what what is going on. And deep learning is just one of different machine learning techniques. However, it's definitely the most important one. And in the recent years, it has achieved really tremendous uh, success. That's why it's so, it's so exposed. 
And then we have different disciplines like computer vision, like uh, natural language processing, language technologies, and so on. Even robotics, for instance, that make use of AI and of deep learning itself and also other, other disciplines. But most advancement have been made in the fields due to deep learning elements in the fields of computer vision and natural language processing. And that's why I will focus on those two areas plus deep learning in my, in my lectures and show you a number of examples what can be done uh, with, with this uh, technology. Just to clarify, what is AI, right? Uh, artificial intelligence, this is my definition. I really like to formulate the definition of AI in this recursive manner, right? Artificial intelligence is a research field dealing with the development of alg algorithms and systems for solving tasks that require intelligence to be solved. I intentionally don't like to draw a parallels between natural intelligence and, and uh, machine intelligence. That's why I say that we need, if we humans need intelligence to solve, solve particular tasks. If we want that those particular tasks are solved by machine, machine has to uh, exhibit a kind of intelligent behavior, right? And this is how I define artificial in, in intelligence. And, and I really don't like to, you know, those stories that AI imitates human and I, that, that's completely not true, right? Uh, maybe uh, AI scientists uh, can be inspired by human intelligence and so on, but I wouldn't really compare those things to do together. However, the real breakthrough that has been made in real in recent years is really uh, exactly in this field that the, the, the methods that you are producing are more intelligent, so are capable of solving the tasks that require high intelligence to be solved. Okay. And machine learning is just one su subfield of artificial intelligence, and it's the field that um, is based on the development of system that, uh, for solving the problems, uh, uses models that are learned from the previously observed data. So this is the main point. We humans, we also learn our entire lifetime, right? And we do some predictions, plans, whatever, based on what we saw in the past and learn some patterns from those uh, observations in order to uh, to improve ourselves and this is a, a kind of the goal of machine learning while deep learning is just one type of machine learning that uses deep artificial neural network for for doing that right for modeling the, that's acquired knowledge uh, and then we have computer vision language technologies computer vision is dealing with images right interpretation and analysis of the images while uh, language technologies are dealing with uh, everything that is related to language, right? From uh, speech recognition to speech understanding, speech synthesis, dialogue processing, machine translation, text analysis, classification, sentiment analysis, text mining, and so on, right? Uh, and natural language processing is a, like a um, uh, umbrella term that encompasses uh, many of those expressions here, like in a wider, wider sense. So I'll present a couple of examples from, from this era, but mostly I will focus on computer vision Actually, this is the field I'm uh, working on. And we'll show a couple of uh, examples from recognition, detection, categorization, uh, visual retrieval, tracking, motion analysis, 3D reconstruction, uh, contact lens measurement. So all that stuff that we as a humans can, all the information that we can extract by our, our eyes, but eyes are only the sense, like the brain as the, the, the machine actually that makes use of this uh, sensorial information that our our brain um, actually acquire. All that stuff is something that computer vision would like to do. All the tasks that you are solving, uh, we're solving visually uh, with using our vision, the computer vision is trying to solve, right? And a lot of our computational power of our brain is actually used for processing visual information. Vision is the most important sense for humans. That's why I see no reason that it, would, it wouldn't be the most important sensor for robots and other intelligent machines as well. But when I'm talking about visual information, we, we usually think about images, right? But they're not only images. And of course, also images can, can come in different shapes, like color images, black and white images, binary images, uh, X-ray images, microscope images, Satellite images, uh, air, airborne taken images. You can have 
visual information in form of videos, right? To process visual sequence of visual information. You can process 3D information. So what you see here is like the intensity image of, of a palm and 3D, uh, like half, two and a half D basically, uh, where the intensity of the pixel corresponds to the distance from the camera to the image. And using such kind of uh, devices, uh, measuring devices, you can create 3D models. Like this is a post-mortem mask of uh, famous Slovenian painter, Richard Jakovic, that we um, produced in the lab years ago. And all this can be achieved using computer vision. And most of the those problems are recently being solved by deep learning. I will slowly come from computer vision to deep learning to show you that basically deep learning is the main force of, of computer vision nowadays, definitely. Okay, but let's, let us first try to define what tasks are solved by, by visual competencies of, of computers, right? What are the computer vision tasks that uh, we are trying to solve? So the most general and widely used maybe even um, computer vision task is classification. So this is the most basic question. You show to the computer an image and uh, the computer should tell what is depicted in the image, right? And then you have different variants like, like this one, categorization, which means that you have a category of a bicycle rider here, right? And all of successful or maybe even less successful riders should be categorized in the same, in the same um, category. And then on the other hand, you have a recognition or identification of instances, right? Okay, so this is the best cyclist in the world. Primo Roglic, right? So uh, the, the idea of uh, recognition is to recognize all different appearances of Roglic. So it's a kind of slightly different uh, task uh, that, that, that we have, right? And then uh, next to identifying who is in the image, localization also tells you where in the image is, right? But here again, you assume that in the entire image, you have one person or one object to detect. But what if you have more of them, right? Then you come to the detection where you need to find Primoz Roglic, for instance, in this image, or to find all bicyclists on different uh, scales, right? And you can even, uh, not only their heads, only the entire body, you can detect their bikes, you can detect the bike in three-dimensional uh, um, pose, right? Not only in 2D. So we have a lot of, of these variances, um, how to define this problem. Instant segmentation means that you don't detect the person only with a bounding box, but with a quite accurate mask, right? So uh, we can go a little bit further. We can try to classify every pixel in the image, whether it is, is bicyclist or is, is the road or is the uh, a sky or something like that. We call that semantic segmentation. And we can go even a little, a little bit further away, uh, further in that direction that we not do not just classify every pixel as a bicyclist or sky, for instance, but we also know which of bicyclists is, right? Primoz Roglic, Pogacar, and I don't know who is, who is the third one, right? So it's even more complex task to be achieved. But now let us try to think how those problems can be solved. Now, I, I, I want to show you that they can't be solved without learning. What is the, the main pipeline of solving these problems? We have camera, uh, camera observes environment, so we, we get some image, right? So we put this image in computer and we have some sequence of images, but let us look at what actually one image is. Nothing else than, you know, usually if you have a color image, we have RGB channels of that image. In every channel, it's nothing else than a matrix of numbers, right? And what you see here is just a small part of one channel of one image, which is just one image in the sequence of images in the video. So you can imagine this is a huge number of, of numbers to be processed. And it's impossible that you say, okay, if the first pixel is zero and the second is one and the third is 55, then this is Roglic, otherwise it's Pogacar. So it's, you can't manually define the rules that would, let's say, classify, classify images. The only way to do it is by machine learning to show a number of images of Roglic and Pogacar and Alaphilippe and whoever else, and tell the system to extract from those images features that are related only to Roglic and only to Alaphilippe. And in this case, 
the system will, will be able to differentiate between, uh, between uh, two of them, right? And you need learning, machine learning that is able to extract that models out of the data, right? And this is what, what deep learning is about. In the last 20 years, most of the tasks that relate to classification and, and, and related tasks are based on, on a kind of learning. And this, what I show here is typical pipeline that was used in vision for, for decades, basically. Uh, let's say that we, we would like to recognize who is this person. Well, if, if I say this person, this assume that the system already knows that there is a person in the image. What is actually depicted in the image? So the system doesn't know anything, right? And usually you would first extract some features. Let's say if, if you have a face, how, how do you recognize who is actually the person that we are, we are looking at, right? Well, we recognize eyes and nose. When you say, ah, this, you know, he looks like his father. What does it mean? It means that it has some particular features in the face that are similar to the features that his father has. Right, and um, if you are able to extract some features, then we just have to remember which features are actually related to which individual person, right? And of course, it's very difficult to extract some high-level features. So usually, this uh, feature extraction in computer vision was based on detecting kind of corners, uh, edges, lines, uh, some uh, very uh, particular small patches, basically, uh, that could be differentiated with, 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 between each other. But the main point was that the researchers manually defined those features, and then you, you would have some learning procedure that would take these features as an input and um, uh, determine which features are really characteristic for Primo Shiloglitch and which features are characteristic for Tadej Pogacar, for instance. And then this would form a model that would be used in the classification to determine the class of the image. So this was the classical computer vision approach for years, for decades, basically. And now, what is the main difference that deep learning brings? Still, we have this model and this classifier here in learning here. But what makes deep learning so powerful is that now we don't have to, to determine these uh, features by hand anymore, right? Deep learning also learns features. So this is what makes deep learning uh, deep, right? That we go all the way from the image itself to the classifier and the deep learning takes care of feature extraction and learning simultaneously. It determines which features are the most discriminative to solve a particular task. And that's the main difference. And this is why in, in this sense, it also selects the best feature. So in this case, um, uh, like researchers manually determined which features are potentially the most, the best for that particular task. But now also this part here is done by deep learning and deep learning simultaneously learns which features are the best one and the model that based on these features uh, make this uh, classification predictions. That's the power of, of, of deep learning. And uh, if you look what these features are, right? And what is actually in, the, in, in, in on, on the input, input um, of uh, this deep learning pipeline, the pixels. So we, in the past, we had to produce the features to be processed with our learner. Now we just put the image in the input, right? Individual pixel present one input uh, in this um, network. And then as we'll see later, our uh, deep network um, combines or extracts some information out of them on the lower layer, layers. What um, network does is actually detect some edges, some orientation of orientations of some local patches, right? Whether we have edge in this direction or this direction or this direction, or maybe some colors or maybe some transformations from one color to another colors. But this is always everything very local, right? Just small patches are being considered. And then when you go to uh, upper layers of the architecture of the network, then those local characteristics are combined together and are combined in, into a little bit more complex uh, features. And then you combine those a little bit more complex features in even more complex features and so on until at the end you have quite meaningful semantical features and usually what you put at the end of your network are a couple of neurons 
a, a couple of of indicators basically uh, and uh, and if you put like the the person in the input the num like the value of this neuron here would be much higher than the value of the rest of the neurons so you will know that this is a person so in why it can do that because on the levels close to the end um, it already knows that those particular combination of a particular combined features is representative, is typical for that particular um, type of output. Donation maybe looks quite too high level, right? But actually produces great results. And I, I always show this slide. It's not just that it's fashionable. We were working on this area, so we would like to promote that. But it actually achieves much, much better results than everything that was developed before. So I'm in this um, research field, uh, yeah, quite a number of years, right? And uh, I was observing the development from one type of methods. Every year it was a little bit better than last year, right? But in 2012, right, when the deep learning was, I wouldn't say proposed because proposed was like 20, 30 years ago. So, uh, but it, it was revived uh, and we'll discuss later why and how the results really jumped, you know, like the, the error was halved every year almost, right? So what I show in this slide here are the results of one challenge. The challenge is like that. You have like a uh, data set of 1.3 million images uh, of 1,000 categories, right? like Leopard, like uh, Dalmatian, like uh, container ship and so on. So imagine you have 1,000 such categories. And uh, the task is to, uh, for, for the system, is to determine, to, to recognize what, what's in the image, right? And if the image, if the system, so the e system outputs five, five categories, five, five labels, basically. And if the correct answer is among those five, then the answer is deemed correct. Right. Because for instance, in this case, if you say uh, cherry or if you say Dalmatian or if you say dog or if you say fruit, right, all of those answers are correct. So if you only consider top one, we, we, we say that top five uh, classification. Top one would mean that you would all, all only uh, verify uh, whether the, the, the first, like the top answer is correct. Uh, it wouldn't be very fair because some of the answers can be multiple answers can be correct, right? So that's why we have um, in these challenges, they usually have a little bit more or less metrics, but this doesn't matter actually. Uh, what, what does it matter are the results, right? So they started with this in 2010, but I'm pretty sure even if they started that before, you know, it, it would, it would like, it would like that. Every year it would, the error would fall for like 2% or something like that. But you can see that uh, in the year 2012, when uh, Alex Krzyzewski's uh, paper was published and they used deep learning to solve that task, it fell from 26 to 16, right? And in the following years, it fell to 12 and then to seven and so on. And, and from 2017, they do not hold this change anymore because they, they show that human performance on this particular task is about 5%, right? So this is all noise, basically, 1% up and down. Uh, it's really uh, can't judge which, which method is better. But what I want to show is that really the performance has increased tremendously in last, let's say, eight, nine years due to deep learning. And let us see this slide as a motivating example uh, for all what will come next. So uh, the question is why, right? Why did we experience such kind of, of um, uh, improvement. And one part of the answer is because uh, I didn't go into the, I don't have time now to go into the history, but actually Jan LeCun published uh, Convolution Neural Networks, Linet Architecture in 1998. However, there are three main reasons as, as I see them, uh, why we have this huge, really uh, change of paradigm in, in computer vision, NLP and in AI such. Uh, and these improvements uh, of these methods. The first one is we have now more data. And it's true that computer, uh, the, that deep learning actually needs a, a lot of data to be trained. So if I draw a simple, simple diagram, if you have here data and let's say performance here, right? In standard machine learning algorithms, you get something like that. Usually, 
more data that you have, better results that you, you obtain, but you sooner or later you achieve some a plateau and you can't improve results anymore, right? For machine learning, if you don't have a lot of data, you don't get good results, right? But after that, if you have really a lot of lots of data, then you can significantly improve the results of machine learning. And nowadays, I said before that ImageNet, it has 1.3 million images. And not just images, annotated images. For every image, we exactly know what it depicts, right? And this is huge amount of, of work was needed to, to come up with such such a such, um, uh, data set, right? So this is one very important reason why do we have this great success nowadays. The second reason is that now we have more computer uh, computing power than we had. So for um, computing, for not not for using, but for training those models I was show, uh, I showed before, you need a lot of computational power, and those architectures that um, that are that will be shown tomorrow, basically, and are used to to to, to create these models um, can be so the computation, the, the learning itself, and also then the inference can be paralyzed paralyzed significantly. So uh, everything is based on convolutions and all such stuff that can really be um, if you have a lot of uh, CPU or GPU kernels, uh, the computation itself can be significantly faster, right? And um, the problem is that research community is not large. So the, the, the uh, computer companies would not produce special purpose, uh, at least in the past, special purpose um, CPUs only for researchers that are working in, in, in deep learning. Right? But we're quite lucky that also the gamers, right? And we have a lot of gamers that like to play computer games in the world. They use a very similar uh, hardware than we actually need. Very powerful GPUs to render all those cars and whatever they are um, playing with uh, in the screen uh, in real times uh, in, uh, all the time, right? So, or not to mention the, the Bitcoin miners, right? They also need a lot of GPUs. So the market was quite large for uh, demand was for powerful GPUs that have a lot of parallel kernels uh, inside was quite uh, large. That's why, of course, uh, like the prices drop and they invested a lot in the, in the development of, of this kind of GPUs. And now we have very powerful GPUs we can, we can make use of. So this is the second um, reason why these methods are now so successful. We have more computing power. And the third one is that we also keep improving the learning algorithms all the time, right? So there is a lot of novelty, a huge amount of researchers is working on these topics and every month, basically, you have something new that can be utilized to solve various problems. So those three advancements really kicked development in this era. And just to reinforce what I'm, what I'm just saying, right? Uh, I took this photo in, in late October in 2019. So basically that was the final, the last major computer vision conference that was held in, uh, in live, right? Uh, on site in Seoul, in Korea. And it depicts the number of participants for last 32 years. So ICCV is the major computer vision conference. Every year we have like two, ICC or ECCV and CVPR. So ICCV is you know, one of, one of two major conferences that are um, in the field of computer vision that are organized every year. So all the researchers that, that matter actually send papers there. And then if you want to see what is really the state of the art in this field, you go to ICCV. And this is the number of participants, right? And it's completely clear, clear that every year that you had like around you know, 300, 400, 500, maybe up to 1,000. But after 2009, 11, the number of participants start growing, right? And to like a year and a half ago, we had 7,500 participants. I don't know what does it mean for your conferences? How big are, are your conferences? So, but in our area, this is quite a huge number, especially if you compare it with the previous numbers. And this conference will be organized in Paris in, in two years, and they booked 12,000 seats. 
right? So they are still expecting this to, to grow. And actually, it's a reason behind that, right? Because it became very useful, very popular. These are the number of like the sponsor that were fighting for students there. So it's really the success of the methods is reflected in a huge, huge demand from, from companies as well. Uh, or to even um, uh, reinforce uh, the, the, the importance of deep learning field. So as you know, in computer science, we don't have a Nobel award, but we have a Turing award, right? Which is a kind of Nobel prize in computer science. And two years ago, it was given to Joshua Benjo, George, um, Jeffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun, let's say founding fathers of this new wave of deep networks, right? Uh, to recognize really the, the great importance of, of these methods. If you go now, it's, it, for, for me, it's really fun fact. If you go into the conference computer vision now, like 90% of the papers that solve 90% of the problems are based on deep learning. So five years ago, 10 years ago, I couldn't imagine that. It's really something. Let me now conclude this introductory lesson with an overview. Of how, does, how does it work? Right. Uh, again, very top down view and tomorrow we'll go a little bit from bottom up to, to the math, basically. So what we'd like to have is a classifier, a classifier that would get as an input a sample and it would produce some prediction. And now this sample can be an image and prediction would be, you know, the class, which bicycle is this or a sample could be a text. And the prediction would be, okay, this text is about archaeology or about computer science or about sports, right? Or this sample can be some um, data about some um, um, laboratory tests, right? And the, and the classifier would tell you which disease this probably is or, or something like that. So you can imagine a lot, a lot of um, um, tasks that can be solved in this manner, right? But this class classifier to work it has to have uh, at hand a model actually that knows, like the classifier itself is just a routine that, um, that executes, ex executes this, this um, uh, prediction task, right? But the model is the most important thing that tells the classifier which patterns are there that um, relate to this in this particular class in order to, to uh, um, classify the sample. Um, what I want to emphasize at this point is that in order to have this model here, we can't hard code this model. We can't say, uh -huh, if this is that, then this is okay, otherwise it's not, right? We learn that and learn, learn that from data. And to do that, we typically must have a number of training samples. And usually, we'll see that it, this is not always the case, right? We have supervised methods and, and unsupervised methods and so on. But for the beginning, let us assume that for every sample, every image or text or, or whatever type of data we have, we have one ground truth, a correct, a ground truth prediction, as we, as we say, right? This is Roglic, this is Pogacar, this is Alaphilippe, and so on, right? And what is the goal of this learning here? The goal is that uh, creates such a model, right? That once this model is used by the classifier, it, it can predict the same prediction as it was given as an input, according to some measure that we, uh, we specify. And this is all about, the main point is how to minimize the, the error between the predictions and the ground truth. However, we must take care that it's useless if we uh, minimize this error, right? If you create this model that is able to, I don't know, classify all the training samples correctly, right? But it, it fails on novel samples, right? So for, for the training samples, we already know their labels. We, we don't need to take classes. That's useless if it can only work on training samples. We need to have this learning design in such a way that it can successfully predict the classes or, or the numbers, regressions, whatever, right? Of the previously unknown samples. And this is a little bit challenge. And this is the big picture really of machine learning. So. 
uh, how to do that? So how to create such learning mechanisms that can produce such models as, as, as well as possible? That's the 